Joining us now is Johnson & Johnson Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Paul Stoffels. Dr. Stoffels, great to have you here. The news today, you've accelerated the planned start of human clinical trials for your COVID vaccine by at least a month, now planning to start at the second half of July. Previously, you'd said September. How have you been able to accelerate these timelines so much? Thank you, Meg, for having me. Um, yes, we have been able to accelerate because we came quickly to the selection of the final candidate, for the candidate faster than we expected based on very strong animal data. The non-human uh, primate data showed very good results, and that's where we selected our final candidate. Um, we could accelerate then time to the clinical material for phase one clinical trials, as well as we worked with the regulatory authorities, FDA and in Europe, to accelerate time part, the time to phase one. And that is now planned for the second half of July. You're also saying that, you know, based on the phase one results and conversations with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, you could also accelerate the planned start of phase three. The Wall Street Journal reported you may begin that large phase three trial as soon as September. Does that timeline look right to you? And how are you forecasting how much infection we might be seeing in the United States at that time and whether efficacy can be proven quickly? Yeah, first, the timing of the start of the phase three, of course, depends on the phase one, how the outcome is and the discussion with the regulator then to start phase three. But we are going to start, uh, we are going to study a single dose as well as a boosted dose and evaluate that. And, um, and that, that leads then to a mid September, uh, late September start of efficacy. Um, we at least, we start planning now uh, for efficacy studies uh, starting mid September. Um, answering on the question on what, uh, where, the, where is the epidemic at that moment and the incidence, uh, we don't know, but it's, uh, it's expected that there might be a second wave in the second part of the year in the U.S. And together with the NIH, uh, we are looking into how can we make flexible arrangements to go north, south, east or west in the U.S. and, uh, and see where the highest incidence at that moment is to start a clinical trial. In addition to that, we also look in international, whether it's South America and Europe or, or even in Africa, to see if needed, where can we recruit the number of people to be vaccinated to uh, have enough uh, uh, people in the study to get to efficacy uh, signals fast. Mm. Oh, well, I also want to ask you about safety, uh, moving at these unprecedented speeds. You know, Zeke Emanuel and Paul Offit wrote in the New York Times in an op-ed uh, just a couple days ago that, quote, if only 20,000 people get the vaccine in trials, serious but rare side effects might be missed. How do you ensure safety moving at these speeds and with this size of trial? Yeah, first, we, we, we have already vaccinated with the same vector more than 65,000 people. That gives us already a lot of comfort, that, that, and it's very well tolerated, extremely well tolerated in other, other uh, vaccinations, such as Ebola, Zika, RSV, HIV. Um, we will go and study at least 30,000 people, but probably depending on the incidence, uh, if that's lower, we go up to several 10,000 more. So somewhere between 30 and 100,000 people will be evaluated. Um, but let's reassure you, Mac, we will not take uh, undue risk here. We want to have a safe and effective vaccine, and we will do whatever is needed. We'll also test the vaccine in, in elderly people as well as in younger. So we'll have all, uh, all parts of society participate in phase one and into the efficacy studies to make sure we learn as much as we can before we bring the vaccine to people. Mm -hmm. What is your expectation of the criteria that regulators are looking for to make their first approvals, whether they're approvals or emergency use authorization? Will they be looking for how well the vaccine actually protects against people getting infected? Or as some have suggested, will they be making those decisions potentially based on the antibody response from the vaccine, looking at whether we generate antibodies, uh, but perhaps not waiting to see if we're actually prevented from getting infected? All the discussions we have today with the regulators is about a real clinical endpoint. Can we prevent infection or can we prevent disease? It is, and there will be a lot of other markers which will be measured, and we want to do that in a large uh, data sharing effort so that everyone can learn. 
But uh, our objective is to do a clinical efficacy study with clinical endpoints. Can we prevent infection? Can we prevent disease? Um, maybe that could change in the future if data are very strong with other vaccines, but at the moment we don't count on that. We want to have clean efficacy and clean safety. Mm. Well, you also mentioned you are pursuing the potential for giving a booster shot. What is your expectation of how long immunity from a potential vaccine, your potential vaccine, might last? Well, we don't know that from this, but we know from the vector and like in Ebola that now we have data of three, four years. That was with a prime boost. In RSV, we are now doing studies with a single injection, and that's what we are learning now. So we might have a good chance to have a single dose injection to start with, but to get long-term protection, most probably we'll need to give a boost one, two or three years later. But that speculation at the moment will um, we'll demonstrate that in clinical trials and all of that will be part of the clinical trial program. Mm -hmm. Right, well, Dr. Stoffels, thank you for joining us. It is early days, you're reminding us and we look forward to hearing more as you start the human clinical trials.